Welcome back everybody to For Goodness Take. Today, we have Harvard guard Spencer Friedman. Spencer, how are you today? I'm doing well, Evan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. So today we're going to talk some basketball, banter back and forth, and all that good stuff. To kick it off, what is your earliest memory of basketball? My earliest memory of basketball is probably me being somewhere around five years old and watching my dad play at a park that's not too far from my house, just sitting out there and watching him. Um, I think that was probably the first moment I realized that, you know, I really enjoyed basketball as a whole. Of course, it's always fun, like, playing, but when you enjoy watching it, I think that that makes it a little more special. Okay. When did you start getting into it, like picking up the ball, going on the court, going in games? When did that start to happen? Um, that's an interesting question. So basically my entire life I've been playing. And um, just like for fun and for the enjoyment, um, probably from, you know, ages like five to seven or eight, I was just playing with my friends and my cousins or kids that lived in the area, whatever it was, it was just all fun and games. And then um, I think when I was like eight years old, like eight or nine, I really just loved playing. And that's when I, I really got into it heavily and started training and playing all the time. And it, was an, it became an everyday thing for me around eight or nine. Once you became better and better, did those kids in the neighborhood stop wanting to play with you? Because at your peak in high school, you were one of the best players in the nation. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, my cousins and I, we used to go play at this park not too far from my house. And eventually it got to the point where they were like, okay, uh, <laughs> we don't want to play with you anymore. It's not as fun as it once was. So, um, but, you know, it's, I mean, that's all part of it. So then I got to start seeing other places and playing against other people and traveling a little bit. And that was a super fun experience. Eventually you landed at modern day. What was that like being a monarch? It was amazing that um, the three years I was there were pretty incredible. It's a, it's a really special place, not just athletically, but also academically as a school in general. The student body is really amazing. And I think the coolest part for me, at least, was being around so many kids that were really incredible in their own ways, whether it was acting or painting or softball, baseball, tennis, whatever it was, you know, football, of course. Um, but like there were so many kids that were so talented. You just, you know, you really learn a lot from being around really, really talented people. It seems every year that team just reloads. They don't rebuild, they reload. Like a new five-star comes, new four-star comes. How do, how do they do that? Why is modern day such a hot spot? At, at this point, it's just so prestigious and the name just rings around the country. So people really want to be a part of that tradition and that history. And Coach McKnight's built something incredible over the 30 plus years that he's been there and people just really want to be a part of that. And it's, it's, it's something that's really special. And, you know, he does an amazing job, but the school is also a really amazing place. And so they really complement each other and it makes it a perfect destination for anyone that really has high aspirations in basketball and also wants to excel academically too. At modern day, did you have any pregame routines that you do that might have even carried over to college? Um, I have a few, I mean, Generally, I like take a minute to like breathe and meditate and really just like focus on like kind of drown out the extra noise. You know, at modern day, we play in some insanely big arenas with large crowds, a lot of people following the games. There was always a lot of expectations. And, you know, you at the end of the day, none of that really matters, right? All that matters is what's going to happen when you get on the court. And so just kind of take a minute to drown that all out and really focus on what's about to happen and at the end of the day it's fun you know it's basketball it's like it's not a job it's not anything more than something I just love going out and doing so that was a big one just taking a minute or two to really lock in and focus. I remember when I went to the 2018 CIF conference championship where I got this beanie you were at the free throw line doing figure eights just at the free throw line while everyone else was shooting around do you still mm -hmm. do that? Yeah I do I definitely do figure eight I think is a really good ball handling drill um, it's something that gives me comfort in my handle. <laughs> um, so I do a lot of that. Do you listen to any specific music before the game? It depends. I'll listen to any and everything before the game. Uh, you know, you don't always go into the game feeling the same way. 
sometimes you need to, you may need a little extra energy. Sometimes you may have a lot of energy and you need to calm it down a little bit, but I'll, I'm open to anything. I don't have any specific, like, this is my pregame playlist. It's just a feeling. Going back to the figure eights, how did you get your handle so tight? How did you get your passing so incredible? Did you pick that up naturally? Did you have a coach? Give me the scoop on that. Yeah, I, uh, I had a lot of different trainers. I spent a lot of time in the gym. Um, everywhere I went, I used to dribble a ball, whether it was down the street or wherever I was going, I, was, I always had a ball in my hand. Um, so for ball handling, yeah, I just spent a lot of time dribbling wherever I was. Um, and passing, I think, I think I learned a lot about passing by watching basketball more than playing. Um, you know, when you watch, you can see, you can see things that you don't necessarily see when you're in the game. Um, and so I would see a bunch of these passes. I love watching Steve Nash, Chris Paul, Mark Price. And I would watch a bunch of film and just watch the passes these guys throw and just how they get it there, the reads that they're making. And then when I'm playing, I can kind of see it like, oh, I saw something very similar to that. This pass might be there. And then, you know, you try over and over and over. You turn the ball over a bunch and eventually you figure it out. So it's just a lot of trial and error and a lot of hard work. Would you consider those three that you mentioned your favorite players or is there someone else in mind for you? Um, those are definitely three of of the players I watch the most. I think Steve Nash is, is definitely my favorite player. I, there's a lot of people I watch. I love watching Curry, especially off the ball. The way he moves without the ball is pretty incredible. Um, Goran Dragic, I think is great. Super crafty. There's a lot of guys. I love watching Rondo passing. He's unbelievable, especially Boston Rondo. Um, but I, I just, there's a lot of guys that I really love watching and, but I, I would say Steve Nash, Mark Price, and Chris Paul are probably my top three. Did you enjoy watching Manute Bull and Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> a little bit. Different styles of play, of course. But um, everyone. I mean, I just love watching basketball in general. It doesn't matter if it's an eighth grade game or the NBA Finals. It's, I'm going to find something about it that I enjoy. Being on that Cali Supreme Elite team, you got to see both Bull Bull and Sharif O'Neal, sons of the two legends I just named earlier. How did that mm -hmm. team form? Did you do a little bit of recruiting yourself or did they just come to practice one day? Um, it was pretty organic, honestly. You know, when Bull and I were at Modern Day, uh, he was friends with Sharif and Sharif wanted to play for the Cal Supreme team and the EYBL. And um, Bull and I wanted to play on the team and there were obviously a bunch of other great pieces on that team and everybody really wanted to be a part of that team. And the majority of us were good friends before. Like we had all known each other. So it really was pretty organic. I mean, we all kind of, you know, the coaches called us and they were like, hey, do you want to maybe play on this team? We're trying to put something really cool together. And when everybody was in and we really, we saw who was on the team, it was kind of like, oh my God, like, you know, these are all my friends, people that I know, people that I have a good relationship with. And so it was super easy and super organic. How fun was it to play with those seven foot towers and just lump the ball to them the whole time? really funny it was it was it was uh it was very fun and very funny they make my life a lot easier I just have to throw <laughs> the ball up and you know they just go get it so it's like you laugh a lot just you know I can make a bunch of mistakes and they make me look way better than I may be playing so that was really nice but um it was so much fun I mean that was a really great experience traveling being in the UIBL um Obviously, having those guys on our team attracts a lot of attention. So our games were just packed. Like, like I mean, it was it was a pretty incredible experience and something that was really fun, I think, for all of us. So, what do you prefer, AAU season or high school season? But I really like both, and um, I think they're very different. You know, high school is more. You have a pretty strict routine right you go to school you go to practice the next day you go to school you go to practice and school you have a game and it's really fun because all your friends you know your family everybody can come to the game um and I feel like there's a lot more on the line in high school you know your whole school wants you to win your teachers they talk about it the next day and in AAU it's like you might have like three games in one day. So if you lose, you're like on to the next one. You can't think about it. Sometimes your family can't be there because it's far away. Um, 
it, they're just different environments, but they're both really fun and they're both totally different. And I really enjoy both. I think for me, high school was probably more enjoyable just because my family could come to a bunch of games and I just love when they can watch me play. And But AAU is still pretty amazing. The travel, the kind of craziness and the hecticness of it all is, it's just fun in its own way. One of the craziest parts of AAU season, in my opinion, is the amount of offers that can come in in one day. So what was the recruiting process for you like, and why did you choose Harvard amongst all the other schools that offered you? Um, the recruiting process for me, I really always had my eyes set on a high academic school. I was, I've always been super into academics, and my parents have always really preached it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to play forever one day, whether it's next week or 20 years from now, I probably won't be playing basketball. So, you know, I need to have a, a set myself up for, you know, life after basketball. And so going to a really good academic school was really, really important to me. And Harvard is, of course, one of the best academic schools that you can go to. And when they started talking to me and Coach Amaker started talking to me and we formed a really good relationship and things were really smooth and easy. I didn't really have to be anyone else. I didn't have to, you know, try to do anything special. And um, We really formed a great relationship and a bunch of the kids on those team, on the Harvard basketball team were friends of mine from before. There were a few from LA or from San Diego that I had known and they were really great about the whole process. And once I took, uh, we actually played in we played in the Springfield Hall of Fame, the Naismith Hall of Fame classic my sophomore year of high school. And um, after that game, we played Oak Hill. And after the game, I went to go walk around the campus. And it was, it, it was snowing and I'd never been in snow before, but it, I just felt comfortable there. And I knew that if I felt comfortable in the snow in a place 3,000 miles from home, that I was going to be all right. So that was... At that point, I was pretty set on my decision. Were there any other schools aside from Harvard that were like, okay, maybe this school, but right when you walked out, you knew it was Harvard in the snow? Um, there were a bunch. You know, I was really open to everything. I was, no matter what the school was, whether it was a small school in the East Coast or a big school out here, I was really open to whatever school. And um, I formed a lot of really great relationships with a lot of really amazing coaches. And I'm super grateful for those relationships. And, um, but at the end of the day, it just, Harvard just felt like the right place. My relationship with the kids on the team, um, the small school environment is kind of more my speed. Uh, my relationship with the coaching staff, they have very big lofty goals and I love that. Um, and I think we really just saw eye to eye and I felt so comfortable at the school and with the the academics and just the experience that I was going to be having and the experience that I am having. And I just, you know, it's an amazing place and I'm happy that I, that I chose it. Well, I believe you made the right choice. And I think the whole entire college of Harvard believes you made the right choice. <laughs> Thanks. Of course, being on Harvard for the past two years, what has been your favorite experience so far? Best memory? Um, that's a great question. There are so many there. That's the best thing is, uh, you know, every day you make a new amazing memory, right? Whether it's eating lunch with your teammates or in practice, something crazy happens or winning a big game. There are a ton of amazing, amazing memories that I have so far. And I really don't think I can pinpoint one specific memory, but um, I can honestly say that it feels like every day or every other day I'm making something, some type of memory that I feel like is just the greatest memory ever. So um, I guess if I had to pinpoint one, I don't know, my, me and my other classmates, Mason Forbes, Kale Catchings and Noah Kirkwood, we're all really, really close. And we have a bunch of funny memories and good memories together. I'm sure my favorite memory is one with all of them, but there's too many to pinpoint one of them. Well, it seems like you have an, a lot of interesting memories. So hopefully you can disclose some of them one day and pinpoint one of them. <laughs> but as it seems right now, I have a very wider variety of what I can picture you guys doing on campus. 
yeah well uh we we have a we have a good time we'll do anything and everything we basically eat dinner together every night sometimes we'll just go like sit in the library study like boring things super fun things i mean we'll do anything we uh we generally go to like movies once every week or once every two weeks and those are always some pretty fun experiences um just like we just you know we'll go around boston we'll do anything and um i think that's what makes it really fun is it's all spontaneous and nobody's ever putting an idea down and we're open to trying new things all the time have you ever, have you guys ever tried a snowball fight before uh no <laughs> we're not good at those <laughs> it's hard it's a lot harder than i thought to like craft the snow into a ball and really throw it <laughs> I think you'd be good at it though, the way you sling the ball, the basketball, maybe once the ball's <laughs> formed, like you can get one of the scoopers, like you put in the snow, forms it for you, and then you can toss yeah, it. Yeah, I might have to get one of those. <laughs> well, aside from the friend part at Harvard, but going back to the basketball part, who is the hardest team to play on the road in the Ivy League? Mm, the hardest team to play on the road in the Ivy League. That's a toss up. I will say that, you know, the Ivy League plays Friday night and Saturday night. So you're back to back. Um, the hardest road trip is Cornell and Columbia. It's a brutal road trip. It's like a five hour bus ride to Cornell, maybe like a six, six and a half hour to Columbia. Um, actually, I think it's like a six, six and a half hour to Cornell and like a five, five and a half. I don't know. One of the two, right? <laughs> um, we're basically sleeping on the bus anyways. So you play the game, you know, game starts at seven, game ends around nine, nine thirty, you get on the bus around ten, and we have to go to the opposite school, either Cornell or Columbia, whoever we didn't just play. And that bus ride is like an extra three, four hours. So you get in at like two in the morning, you check in the hotel, you're not like in bed, ready to go to bed until like three. And then you have like a nine or 10 a.m. shoot around or film session or whatever it is so like that road trip is just it's long and it's brutal and you know losing the second game of that one that bus ride is terrible on the way back um so that is a really tough road trip but I think I think Penn is the hardest place to play just the way their arena is built they have really amazing arena um they get a ton of fans they they do a really good job packing the place and they have, they for sure have a great home court advantage. Does Penn have the best fans in the Ivy League or does Harvard have the best fans in the Ivy League? Um, I think Penn has pretty good fans. I mean, everybody has pretty good fans, of course, but um, I think Penn probably, Penn probably does have the best fans in the Ivy League, but we're, we're working on it. It'll be a process, you know, day by day, we're trying to get more it. fans. <laughs> just interacting with kids or putting flyers up or whatever it is, just to try to get more people at the game. The interesting thing about the Ivy league is like, there's so many people doing so many different things. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes the sporting events aren't as packed as, you know, UCLA or USC games. I was at a UCLA game back when the season was happening and it was pretty empty. I'm going to be completely honest. Compared really? The USC game, it was packed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They both played this. They both played Colorado. UCLA was somewhat empty. USC was filled mm. to the brim. That's so interesting. That's crazy. Penn got a player that I'm familiar with, Clark Slacker, who is mm. an incredible, incredible player. Mm. And pretty impossible to guard if you ask me. But who is the hardest player that you have ever had to guard, whether he was at Modern Day or in the Ivy League or an AAU event? Um... That's another good question. There have been a lot of them. They, I've been pretty fortunate to play against a lot of really, really good players. Um, I can say that I've never actually had to guard him, but I can say definitely the toughest player I've ever seen to defend, I was actually playing on his team at a camp, is Isaiah Briscoe, who went to Kentucky. And when he was in high school, uh, we were – he was going into his senior year and I was in eighth grade and we were on the same team at a camp and um, I'd never seen anybody just like the moves that he was making, the way that he was moving. He, uh, he's definitely the hardest person I've ever seen like to guard. I thankfully never had to actually guard him, but everybody that was guarding him, they were 
high major division one basketball players or now NBA guys and nobody could stay in front of him. It didn't matter what anybody did. He was going to go right by you for a layup. And that, um, so even though I've never guarded him, he's definitely the toughest player I've ever seen to defend in person. You played against Lonzo Ball in high school against Chino, didn't you? Yes. So that's interesting to think that Isaiah Briscoe in high school is more difficult to guard than Lonzo. Yeah, I mean, I think it was different. Like, I also didn't guard Lonzo. We played, like, this funky kind of quirky zone. Um, I mean, you know, against that team, it's like yeah. the way they play is so unique that, like, you kind of have to switch up your style a little bit. But, um, I mean, Lonzo was amazing. Like, in high school, he was ridiculous. It's – I just – the way they play, like, it wasn't a lot of half-court offense, so I can't really say he was the most difficult player to guard. I mean, he was one of the most effective players I've ever seen, for sure. Like, the way he impacted the game was pretty crazy, and, you know, they were an amazing team. So, but yeah, I, I'm going to stick with Isaiah Briscoe. Okay. When you're not playing basketball, what are you doing? A lot of different things. Uh, I'm a computer science major so sometimes I just code things or learn different languages or different skills um I spend a lot of time playing video games with my younger brother or working on music with my younger brother um it's a good way to just you know hang out with him and spend a little time and it's fun I read a ton of books I'm a huge reader I generally read like two books at a time one I'm physically reading and the other I audiobook um, I actually, believe it or not, just built and launched an app in the app store. It's a social media app for gamers. It's called Clip It. Um, it launched about three weeks ago. And uh, so that is something that I've been spending a bunch of time on. Um, and other than that, I like to play cards. I actually play a lot of cards. I don't know why or how I really got into it, but, um, or I'm learning something, whether I'm like reading or watching like a master class or a YouTube video or whatever it is. I, I will say that I'm always doing something. I'm very rarely like doing nothing, sitting, watching TV. What books have you been reading? What video games have you been playing? Give me some more details on that. Yeah, a bunch of Fortnite, a bunch of uh, <laughs> Warzone. A little bit of 2k um books i'm actually in the middle of uh this tiger woods biography right now that is really really good it's really interesting really amazing i've actually been reading somehow um like two or three books on golf i don't really know why i heard they were really good books and i've been reading them and they're pretty good there's this book called golf is not a game of perfect um it's a short book. It's pretty interesting. It's just about like these little things. I always feel like there's something you can pick up um, from any sport, right? So like the intricacies of golf are very mental. And I think that rolls over to basketball a lot. Um, aside from that, I've read Relentless by Tim Grover, this book called Loon Shots, which is kind of about like the formation of these crazy ideas and the cultivation of these crazy ideas. Um, I've read the I've read a lot of autobiographies. The Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, um, or just stepped down. But I read his autobiography. I've read the Tim Cook autobiography, the Steve Jobs biography by Walter Isaacson. I read this other crazy book about like the formation of the computer and just technology as a whole, also by Walter Isaacson. Um, this book called Bad Blood which is like an investigative journalism story um, about a tech startup or a like medical tech startup in Silicon Valley. Um, I've read quite a few books. There's plenty more, but um, those are some of the books. What are some of your favorites? If you can give me like a top three to five, what are some of your favorite books of all time? Um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, I think is amazing. It's like a self-help book, but it's so interesting. Just all of the, the lessons that are in there. Um, another really good book is this book called Billion, The Billion Dollar Whale. It's an investigative journalism story from a year or two ago. It's about a, 
it's an unbelievable story. It's <laughs> like literally unreal. It's about a guy who basically um, finds a way to finagle over five billion dollars in like liquid cash um, from like these different governments in Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, um, just all these like different areas of the world that have a lot of money and he finds a way to kind of get all of it and um, it literally happened like two or three years ago and I mean it, they still they can't catch the guy they can't find him to this day so they know where he is he's just like out of the jurisdiction of all these countries that uh, have arrest warrants out for him it's pretty crazy um, it's like it's like a fiction novel but it's a true story that's the craziest part um, I really like Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. I thought it's just interesting how, you know, it's Nike, right? Like when you think of Nike, it's like, oh my God, like Nike. But I thought it was, it's really interesting to hear the story of like how Nike actually became, it became Nike. It's not like the straightforward, you know, easygoing, like, oh, we signed Michael Jordan. It's kind of like an actual underdog story. Like they really didn't have, they, it wasn't it wasn't meant to succeed from the beginning and Phil Knight really found a way to to make it work um, but those are probably my top three for sure there's a bunch I've of been, other really good ones I've been doing a lot of reading too this summer for my mm. English class yeah it's been pretty tiring for me kind of kind of a grueling experience being yeah to be honest I'll be real with you reading is a uh, it's practice. I, there are times where I, if I don't read for a little bit, I really struggle to pick up a book and read. But once you start reading or audio booking or both, you, you just get better and better at it. It becomes easier. What have you been reading? So with me, I've had to read Walden by Henry David Thoreau mm -hmm. and Moby Dick, which was, that was an experience. <laughs> so with me, I wanted to get those out of the way as soon as possible. Mainly, well, because A, just so I don't have to worry about it, and B, just so I can focus on other things and just, you know, enjoy myself more during the summer. Mm -hmm. So for Moby Dick, it took me 10 days to read, six hours a day, and I was just wow. taxed. I was taxed after reading that. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing, though. That's so great that you got it out of the way and did it early, unlike most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot but, of my friends haven't even started either. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you. Well, I'm going to switch gears on you right here. This is called the speed round. I'm going to say All a word right. and you're going to say a memory, phrase, idea, just anything that comes to your mind first. You can say it, you can do it, you can write it down, whatever floats your boat the best. All right. The Ball Brothers. Um, playing them at USC. Well, two of that those three. At USC. Man. Yeah. Monarch. Modern day, of course. Yale. Not as good as Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Circuit. The UIBL. Spencer Friedman. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to switch it up on you one more time. Mm -hmm. This is called Recruit Me. So I'm a five-star shooting guard out of Los Angeles who just so happened to graduate from Modern Day as well. Mm -hmm. My final four schools are UCLA, Duke, Yale, and could you guess the fourth one? Harvard. Harvard. Nice. So how are you going to convince me to com commit to Harvard so we can form one of the best backcourts in the NCAA? I think it would be pretty easy. I think, uh, you know, if you're a five-star shooting guard, no matter where you go, you'll probably have a good opportunity to go to the NBA relatively soon. And what better place than Harvard? I mean, it's the best education the, the world offers. It's just an incredible community. You know, every day you're surrounded by literally the world's expert in whatever. You know, all your professors are the world's expert in whatever their subject is. And you get, you're get you around kids that are some of the most successful kids that you've ever heard of. I mean, kids are doing unbelievable things every day. And it just, it pushes you to be a better person. And then, of course, basketball-wise, it's yes, it's an Ivy League school or a mid-major school, but there's high major ambitions and 
I mean, the Ivy League right now in talent is growing tremendously. Yale, Penn, Princeton, all of these schools are getting major, major talent. You know, they're bringing in kids that have high major offers, whether it's SEC, Pac-12, or it doesn't matter where they're, the Ivy League is now getting a bunch of those kids. And so the competition is only growing. You're going to have an opportunity to play against the best. And there's no place like Harvard. And that's something that I can only say, you know, if you came and visited, you'd be able to understand a little better. Okay. Well, I've cut UCLA and Duke. So it's down <laughs> to Yale and Harvard. Because mm-hmm. kind of the similar, high, super high academics, super high competition. So right now they're an even playing. Talk about Coach Tommy Amaker. Talk about game day. Maybe you can push me over the edge for Harvard. Yeah, I mean, well, first, the easiest thing to push you over the edge is we're in Boston and they're in New Haven. And Boston is a little bit nicer than New Haven, for sure. Um, nothing against Yale, of course. But um, TA, Coach coach is amazing. He's um, – Coach Amaker is really amazing. He – like, for – okay, so on our game days, you know, we have our walkthroughs and we go over our whole game plan. And, you know, at the end of the day, he says it really just comes down to – how bad do you want it? You know, we can go over all these things and we can do this, but like, we still have to go out there and perform. And um, he's really about the players. You know, he, he really loves and cares about each and every one of us. And he's so much more than just a basketball coach, which I'm super grateful for. And I know our entire team is, he does so many things off the court that are so helpful to us, whether it's introducing us to alumni to help with internships or job offers or, taking us to see different museums or different, you know, historical things that are just really insightful, things that we can really learn from. Um, He's really all about us. He's willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that, you know, we're learning, that we're growing, that we're becoming better human beings before basketball. You know, he knows it's a lot bigger than just the game. And obviously he's an incredible coach, played at Duke and, has coached at a bunch of schools and really, you know, he's, he's, he's all around a great person. And I mean, off the court, off the court to me is, is so much more than on the court because of course, you know, you're getting a great basketball coach and, but seeing how great of a person he is off the court really just makes him that much better in my eyes. And, you know, every day you learn something new from him whether it's about basketball or whether it's about something in history, you know, he starts every practice with a quote and uh, they're always, you know, these really, really deep quotes that make you think about a bunch of different things and get your mind rolling. And he's taught me so many lessons on the court, but he's taught me twice as many lessons off the court. I'm leaning towards Harvard right now. The one thing I want to hear though, talk about game day beforehand afterhand during the game paint me a picture of harvard basketball um we have you know stretch walk through in the morning get some shots up then you have a few hours to kind of get treatment do whatever you need to do before the game you get to the game we have our whole pregame routine that starts a couple hours before the game um the game goes we win and then actually i forgot something so then we have <laughs> we have a pregame meal before the game so we all eat together as a team. It's in the gym. It's actually, so your background right now, it's directly across from your background. So it'd be right above your head. Um, okay. <laughs> that's where we'd be eating. And uh, we all eat together and we talk and the coaches are in there. Everybody's there and we're all talking, whether it's about the game or, you know, basketball in general or anything. And, um, and then we go, we have a little bit of time. We get back in the routine um get treatment do whatever you need to do get back on the court a couple hours before the game go through our whole pregame stuff um we come in and coach hypes us up tells us you know gives us some last second adjustments whatever it is um just little things about the game the scouting report things that we may have forgot to talk about or things that he really wants to emphasize and then we go out there we win and then after the game we come in and we talk and um normally we as a team talk and then he comes in a couple minutes after we have some time to talk and he tells us his thoughts and of course he's going to be like you guys played amazing we you know we won and everything's great no but um 
he gives us his thoughts and he's real. You know, if he if we won and he doesn't feel like we played up to our expectations or the way that we could have played, uh, he'll be honest with us. And I think that's something that's really important. A lot of coaches and people in general get so obsessed with wins and losses or making shots and missing shots. You know, you could shoot a really great shot, it might just not go in. And you can play a really great game. You might not win. And, you know, we sometimes have some of those. We have some bad games that we do win. And he's totally honest with us about it. He's not going to sugarcoat it. He's not going to He's not going to tell us we played great when we didn't. And he's not going to tell us we were terrible when we were great. You know, he's going to be honest and be real. And it's it's. he always says it, it doesn't matter what's on the scoreboard at the end of the game. It's It's about how we feel about us and how we played today. And he's very true to that. So that is something that I know our team is pretty, pretty grateful for. Well, I think I've heard enough. With everything you've been saying, Harvard <laughs> sounds great. And so I'm going to commit to Harvard. Love that. <laughs> Go Crimson. Take home some Ivy League championships in the future. Of course. Nice visor. <laughs> Thank you. I have the, the hoodies on the way, too, and the letter of intent on the way, too. But Sweet. The, the visor came a couple days early. That's great. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this concludes this episode of For Goodness Take. Spencer, thank you so much for being on the show. Any final questions or comments? Not at all. I really appreciate you having me. Thanks for the time. Of course. Best of luck to you and the rest of the squad next season. And me too, because I'm going to be joining you guys come basketball season. Definitely. Thank you. Of course.